Hello, and welcome to Traverse. My name is Francisca Airy. I'm a theater and opera director talking to you from the Ram Theater in Budapest, Hungary. Every week I'll be talking to different industry professionals from all over the world about their careers, the shifts and adjustments they had to make during this pandemic, and their hopes and dreams for the future. This is Traverse. What's next for our industry? Today's guest is Ben Kidd, a Dublin-based theatre director. Together with Bush and Carzell, they lead Dead Center, a company that have created award-winning work in Dublin, London, Berlin, and Vienna, and have toured their shows to various places including New York, Hong Kong, Russia, China, and Australia. They are the minds behind shows such as Hamnet, Chekhov's first play, or one of my personal favorites, Lippy. Last year, Ben and Bush premiered To Be a Machine, a live stream show using technology, questioning what does it mean to be human. Hi Ben, how are you? I'm all right, thanks. I'm pretty good. Yeah, not so bad. How are you? I'm all right. I'm, uh, I'm still uh, in Hungary, in Budapest. We still have a curfew at 8 p.m. Nothing has changed. Uh -huh. Where are you now? I'm in Dublin, Ireland where there has never been a curfew. I think curfews, I don't know what, there must be sort of cultural uh, particularities around certain civilizations whereby curfews are a more appropriate thing to do in the light of this. Because I don't think the UK has ever had curfews. In it. And you're, you're in a theatre. I am in a theatre. I'm at the Ram Theatre. It's empty at the moment. Are you sitting in the audience or... Yes. You're sort of looking at the stage and behind you is the, the sort of dark doominess of the uh, auditorium. Okay, nice. nice yeah, I'm nice. down in the stalls. I think it must be one, two, three, four, five. I'm in row seven. Seven, it's a good row. Yeah, I think so. I think I've yeah. got the best seat as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The best seat to watch nothingness unfold. I wanted to ask you, how, how has lockdown been for you? So if you look at this uh, this year of 2020, Gosh, I don't know. It's, I suppose, there's so many different ways to think about it. I think one should start, I should start with talking about the areas and positions in which I've been very fortunate. And one of those is professionally, I have to confess. I work mostly with a company called Dead Centre. It's well, I work entirely. That's what my professional work is. And we were in rehearsals a year ago for a tour of a show called Hamnet, which we made in 2017, which was going on tour to Madrid in Spain. But, but they were being really, really bullish. No, oh, no, we think it's going to be fine. We think it's going to be fine. It was a real sort of, it was a sort of sequence from a disaster movie where you're sort of seeing things come up on your social media with sort of, you know, school halls being turned into hospitals and stuff in Madrid. And we were like, yeah, I just don't think we're going to be going, are we? You know, and the sort of, in all of us, the sense of kind of lack of, belief that it was actually going to be as big as big as it's been was it, it's kind of staggering now the cognitive dissonance we were kind of living with for a while mm -hmm. because we rearranged that from april 2020 to june 2020 <laughs> like they were like yeah we'll do it in june and I was like, okay cool and then we really weren't gonna do it in june and so, but that was a small gig you know it was a, a touring opportunity which would have been wonderful and will hopefully happen at some point um, in 2021 um, i was actually living in the uk when covid happened but the company is based in ireland i've since relocated to dublin um, and we knew from looking around us from our peers in the industry that that people were so horribly hit dublin ireland went into lockdown about a week or two before the uk so it was quite it was kind of a, a kind of weird glimpse into the future well um you know, the UK was still doing this strange kind of attempt to stave off the inevitable and stave off reality, you know. You know, we, we were immediately not uh, too exposed because we didn't have anything going into production, but an opportunity came up for us to make a piece of work. Um, and we were really nervous about doing that because it, it represented the, it, it was a project that we'd been looking at for 
ages, but it was very, very, very gentle, small, slow planning. And had COVID not happened, I don't think that project, a project which ended up being called Fear Machine version 1.0, that project would never have made it to audiences uh, until like 2022. That was the plan. We, we was very gentle, but an opportunity arose and we were asked by Dublin Theatre Festival if we wanted to try and think about making something for a potentially for a streamed audience and we definitely were not keen to we didn't want to and felt like we wouldn't be able to but obviously the twin things of feeling like it's um, stupid to not to turn down the opportunity to try and think through the moment we're in through one's work you know it's it's such a so often one is annoyed at did ability to do that you're making stuff and you think what's this really doing for the world what's it saying to the world what's it it could have been made at any time ever and this was going to be something whereby that challenge was kind of impossible to um to avoid uh, but also a purely practical level you know let's get a bunch of artists and practitioners paid and let's get them back in a room making some work and let's let's try and allow ourselves and our regular collaborators and new collaborators to sort of be doing something and it was a real privilege so we spent a lot of 2020 working on that project premiering that project in november sorry october september um, and that project actually um, governors i just i literally don't know if you ask it's, what it's all now, a blur isn't it i think i think i saw it uh i think i saw it a uh, december is when i when i saw it um but you, uh, was it was it always going to be a streamed performance to be a machine the show is based on a book by a dublin writer called mark o'connell an irish writer, yeah, a dublin writer kilkenny writer called mark o'connell who um, and we know mark a little bit we knew mark a little bit socially and we had planned to make something out of his book and 2020 in fact began with some small um investigative workshops just sitting around chatting really mostly with bush and mark and jack the performer who performed the piece we didn't know what it was going to be you know we were interested in we were always interested in ways that the piece might speak to the themes of the book which were around transhumanism and technology and a, a drive to use technology to escape the limitations of our bodies so it always had the sort of vague sense in it that there might be something in terms of its presentation that kind of played with or engaged with technology but uh, that sounds very vague doesn't it and the theater festival had to cancel everything in 2020 but Willie, who runs that festival, was very, very keen to not cancel the festival and to present a programme of work of some type. So he came to a bunch of different Irish companies and, and people and said, could you think of something that might either A, could be presented in a socially distanced way or could be presented in a completely streamed way or, <clears throat> excuse me, is something that could at the last minute kind of pivot to a stream in case, you know, it all changed, you know. And unsurprisingly, lots of people didn't want to use the work that they had spent a couple of years developing mm. and in some ways you know, generated the funding for. They didn't want to spend that money on something. And they were right to do that because and what happened is the lot we were making, forming that, preparing that show in sort of September, August, September time, Dublin went into a what they call level five. It was actually level four plus plus or something. Mm -hmm. um, and he had to cancel a couple of things that, that where people had said, okay, I'll do something socially distanced, and nothing was able to take place face to face. But Willie from DTF, from Dublin Theatre Festival, thought that our, he knew that we were working on this project, and he actually said, look, it's a bit, it's kind of about tech, isn't it? And Bush hit upon this idea that about bodies and transhumanism, and the book that we were working on is all about a kind of mania, mostly in kind of modern american tech culture to use technology to transcend our bodies and an understanding that our bodies are hindrances and they're weak and they're maladjusted and not optimized for use because they're just these horrible kind of messy bits of meat that go wrong you know and and so the transhumanist tech utopian dream is that we will cast off our bodies and we will we are information the situation we all found ourselves in at the beginning of 2020 and still find ourselves in is a situation where our bodies are the problem if we didn't have bodies we wouldn't be in this mess that seemed to be a sort of 
a connection. You know, it seemed to be something around kind of the way in which these, I think we said this in the show, rules had been, laws had been enacted to keep our bodies away from each other. And so anyway, there was all that stuff kicking around. And it felt like, hmm, yeah, bodies have been thrust into the limelight here this year. And the only thing we had, I sort of said one day, maybe the audience, maybe it's like a monologue, but the audience from computers in the auditorium. And we didn't think that was necessarily very good, but it did seem like, huh, okay, well, I don't think I've ever come across that before, so maybe. And so we sort of, with those, armed with a sort of sense that, yes, we could see a thematic way in through bodies being a problem. And we could see a kind of formal, kind of practical way to create an event that at that stage was kind of just like, well, yeah, that, maybe that would be a cool installation. And, you know, how, and maybe, how much did you know about that tech when you went into it? No, nothing, nothing. And, 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 and this is how, you know, I realised, by the way, that you asked me how the COVID had been. I just launched into talking about work immediately <laughs> and I've just put about theatre. So maybe if there's time, we can talk about the things that really matter. But no, nothing. Um, but we were very fortunate because we were put on to a guy called Jack Phelan, who's a video designer based in Dublin, who we'd known of for years. We didn't know him and we'd never been able to work with him. And he's always, you know, those people you hear about, oh, you need to work with him. Oh, he's the guy. I don't know. He'll be able to do it. So, so there's a, I hope he does watch this. See, there's a mystique built up around this guy. Right? So, you know, <laughs> it, it is very well deserved, the mystique, because um, he's a bit of a whiz. We were put in touch with him and we said, look, we've got this idea. But what we wanted was to do what has been done in the NBA, the Basketball League in America, what they did. It's good few months later than us i think they used disneyland next like disneyland disney world the one in florida anyway there's a big theme park in florida it was empty because no one was allowed to go to it disney world and they took all the basketball players and they finished the nba season in this sort of mad sci-fi mars bubble in disney world and what they did there <clears throat> is the audience was live on the screens around the auditorium we we wanted originally to do that the initial idea was yeah you'll be live it'll be like on a zoom call you'll be live and you'll be in the audience and we'll see you'll see yourself every so often and you'll be interacting live like you and I are now and after a good bit of research jack said we had far too little time and far too little money to do that in turn realistically and then jack found he, he did a bit of research on some alternatives he came across this kind of service whereby we could we have a website or an app where we could use whereby audience members could upload themselves into so you saw the show when we made it in dublin or yeah um i actually before you carry on just to catch up people who haven't seen it this is a good point isn't it yeah i just sort of realized what the hell am i doing <laughs> are... why are you on about this so we are talking about to be a machine and this is a piece where when you buy your ticket you get a link which I have to give it to you was very smooth. And I think even if you're a technophobe, it's very easy to handle that. When you buy your ticket, you get a link where you're asked to do three things. One, record yourself where you're just watching a performance. One, where you record yourself where you're falling asleep. And one, where you're laughing. And these reactions then are uploaded to this website. And when you actually get to see the performance live, I saw it on Vimeo. Um, you actually see yourself on an iPad in the audience area and everyone else as well. So presumably it's always a different audience every single time. And also I think the most magical part of it was that for a split second, you actually get to see the show from your actual iPad's perspective, which I think was the most magical moment of the entire night. Um, so that just to catch everyone on top, that is the kind of, yeah. that is the kind of anyone's... audience arrangement. If anyone's lasted this long in this chat, I apologise for giving absolutely <laughs> no real insight into what the show is I was talking about. So yeah, exactly. So the simple conceit was that the, it would be performed in an empty theatre, but in, in a place of the seating bank there would be, we always thought, would it be computers or iPads? It ended up being iPads. At the first location was a theatre called Project Arts Centre upstairs in Dublin. It's very well known space in Dublin everyone who, who goes to the theatre regularly will know this space so basically it was going to be shot and f uh, live streamed and th th as soon as we kind of conceded this that a problem kind of emerged because like well yeah it sounds cool doesn't it 110 iPads with people's faces on 
But the only person who's going to see that is the performer standing on stage, right? So how do we, so it became a kind of, we, we joked that it's going to be the most expensive 10 seconds in theatre history because you're going to cut to them once, you know. How can you just cut to audience members here or there? Um, and so, yeah, to get to get back down to the sort of upload process, so like the upload is a website called Video Ask, which we found, Jack found, a company based in Barcelona, I think, who have developed this uh, this app for customer service. So the idea is you're supposed to, be able to take a, a small video of if your boiler's broken or something, and you show, oh, look, this is the problem with the boiler, and you hit send, it goes to the boiler company, and they send you a video back. It's kind of a neat little idea. And so there's this bunch of kind of tech geeks in Barcelona who find it hilarious that there's some sort of theatre company in Dublin are using that <laughs> for completely different reasons, you know. It meant that we were able to start the show before the show started, in a way. Um, and I'm going to shout out here to to a, a mutual um, acquaintance, Tassos Stevens. One of the things Tassos, actually, he's never said this in my presence, but I remember hearing this quoted as maybe a, a Coney theme or something. Um, that a play begins when you first hear about it and it ends when you stop talking about it. It's really true, you know, and, and, or a really useful thing to kind of latch onto. You, you don't want to become product, you know, you don't want to become something that is just, that is, that is someone goes to see on a Wednesday night and they'll go see something else on a Thursday night and they'll kind of, I think it's partly coming from a, from a starting point of being an independent company and making all our own work and not being we as dead center have never have only recently been able to be fortunate enough to be asked by theaters to make work but we still have within us this idea that what we are making is part of our identity and you want you know you, you feel that sense that the or this comes on to something that we think a lot about about what what role the audience is playing in any performance you know we always try and think about trying to cast the audience and so this weird little upload thing was like okay so we could have jack the performer could start talking to people on this app okay so you know, you know it's not a huge thing but it's something you know and yeah we, we use those these three short films as you say in the piece and we the piece it becomes really about the audience then because as soon as you're standing in that room and looking at them when they're uploaded and installed it's just really really humbling you know and really nice and i still think unfortunately that one day maybe we'll run it as an installation and people could just come and look at it because the first time you ever hit go for the first time you see the first sea of faces in the room whoever's working on the show we're just we're just amazed you know it's mm. just really entrancing you know so it became really apparent really clearly really clearly really quickly we're gonna have to try and use the faces as much as possible in the show and that is the in in a way the kind of the um, the special thing about it i think because um we were by that point quite well versed in stream theater i would say there were a lot of streamed performances or you know archived shows that were available online and i think the communal experience of actually being present and being together was completely missing i don't think anyone was really thinking about the audience side and like what actually is is it like and I mean, you guys had a lot of tricks up your sleeve. You know, there was a there was a live chat that suddenly popped up. Um, there were a lot of um, questions about whether this is actually being watched right now, which was incredible because I think putting that kind of spotlight on me as an audience member and having that um, lack of uh, trust maybe and calling me an AI made me very question my humanity in a way. So Good. congratulations. <laughs> Um, and I actually wanted to ask you how much of that um, process was um, dependent on Jack Leeson, because it was very meta, wasn't it? He was very um, much talking about performing itself as transhumanism, almost be being in someone else's skin. I think it was before we had any idea of, Zoo, of, of doing it online, we had hit upon this... Uh, uh, trying to look at the connections between uploading oneself and and acting. Ray Kurzweil, who is the head of engineering at Google, who is featured in the book, encourages everybody to upload a memory to the cloud every day, envisaging a future in which we will one day be able to be completely re 
reconstituted from all that data amassed in the cloud and that might be able to be downloaded into a silicon body that will never die or indeed might be able to just live in a body without a body in some sort of disembodied existence really really kind of mad stuff from incredibly intelligent men usually men, almost always men um, these are super super bright people proposing things that really don't seem to hold much water there's a really interesting moment at which transhumanist utopian scientific ideology starts to sound incredibly religious and incredibly faith-based and it seemed like huh what is the connection between that idea and the idea of uploading a character into an actor you know and so yeah jack had always been the actor who was going to work with us on this project and jack is a fantastic actor and a, and a very erudite and smart and sophisticated human being with a, a great brain on him and he's also someone who jack was played a, a a big part in the tv show game of thrones for many years and as a result he after that show did sort of step back from it it was something he did when he was quite young kind of teenage years into his into his early adulthood i think and he's someone who is really willing to and incredibly um articulate on the subject of discussing what that experience was like and what it was like to kind of be pretending to be somebody else and be very recognizable for that and what that kind of does to you you know mm. and he was also incredibly keen to send himself up you know we were looking at all these people's faces in the audience and they actually weren't that wasn't did you did you see yourself by the way I did. I was tucked away in the third row, but I did see a little glimpse of myself. So a little glimpse. Yeah, well, I, I can get onto a bit of the sort of unfortunate practicalities of how it all worked in a little <laughs> while, but but it kind of uh, it kind of what you realised was you were looking at these people, and these people no longer existed because they uploaded this six weeks ago in some cases or you know two weeks ago or maybe yesterday. But you know that thing about how when you look at the, the light from the sun, what you're seeing is actually whatever it is nine minutes to go or something like you're looking into the past because it takes a length of time to get here and it was like we were looking these this laughter that this person had that was that, that, that's 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 a fossil really you know that that's not actually real and it yeah, added a sort of really strange sadness to it which we kind of managed to lean into hopefully a bit with to mirror with the sadness of the performer on their own it's a really weird experience for the performer we've done it with two different performers actually now because we made the show we remade the show in the german language for a premiere in vienna and both performers have really expressed a kind of strangely disconcerting quality of performance that you have to try and achieve you know when we were making the show with jack originally we definitely benefited from his incredible tv and film chops of being able to sort of stand it you know because it's it's, it's camera work you know it's all on the camera and it, it requires a lot of trickery in terms of quite a lot of the show is pre-recorded when it's supposed to be live and so there's a lot of continuity things and he has to be standing in exactly the right place to come back to, to sell you know but at the same time what we were trying to play with and what we were trying to kind of have fun with and meditate on was the experience that we all know of the kind of the one the, the monologue the one person direct address kind of live kind of theatrical monologue and to have that live connection with an audience you know none of us have really been missing seeing a play what we've been missing is being in a room with a whole bunch of people loving or hating a play you know that that seems to be the thing that we wanted to what we wanted to do is kind of ruminate on what had been lost what could be gained back and then hopefully what would never be gained back but hopefully leave it open maybe we are going to do this more in the future you know maybe we do we will think differently about what we are you know that the book to be a machine is kind of eventually becomes a kind of meditation on what you want for the future of the human race largely depends on what you think a human is. The idea that you can make a play on a streamed play and it will be anything like as good assumes that humans are just information receivers and information givers and whatever information you create for me, it doesn't really matter whether I'm watching in a room or watching on a screen, it's all still information so it'll all still sort of be the same. And the scary thing is a, lot, a large part of that is true but we wanted to try and investigate the place in which it might not be true and the place in which it might be true. I think one of the 
the most profound lines in in uh, To Be Machine is that you call theater the dying medium, um, which when I first heard it, I was like, no, you know, theater geek, <laughs> you're just feeling so angry about that. And then I, I kind of understood the the reasoning behind it. And um, I guess the, the liveness of it and the sharing of it is, it is just different, isn't it? Um, do, do you think there is um, more length to this or was this more of a one-time thing and you feel like you've done your time with streaming? Hopefully anything that you ever do, you think there's any quality and just widens the palette. I think one of the things I've always found really joyful about theatre is the fact that as a medium it seems to me and maybe I'm biased because I work in it and like it it seems to be without limit you can do anything and it can be part of a theatre event we also really like making theatre about the problems and the limitations of theatre right so so hopefully and maybe that's a bit of a kind of cute way to put it but we are interested in trying to poke fun at theatre the thing about theatre being a dying medium, I think, is a sort of, it's an interesting litmus test because I guess most people who watch the show probably thought the same as you about that line, <laughs> you know. But the fact is, most people in the world didn't watch the show <laughs> and most people in the world don't watch our shows and most people in the world don't watch shows. So that, and one can be a bit too dramatic about that because that would be a bit we're a bit silly with that line away but we you know we're always kind of we have to be conscious not to take theatre too seriously and to understand the actual reality of where theatre exists in the consciousness and the culture for most people you know and we, we play with that line about we talk about theatre as a dying medium he, he, he thinks that's true it's 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 the dying medium because it's a place where we all die together in real time and that, and that seems to be a kind of you know, a kind of description of this a slightly a description we're a bit more comfortable with i suppose of what has been lost but the idea that we can all spend time together and die at exactly the same rate um you know every so often in a dark room feels like a kind of more you know it feels like something that kind of has been lost um when we can't assemble in theaters so we'll we have um uh, applied to the Arts Council for some money and got it to buy some gear. We ran a workshop yesterday, or our sound and video designer did, and they're doing another one today on uh, on streaming, on live stream, DIY live streaming for people. We will be interested in, in building this into work going forward, I think, partly just because anything new is always fun. You know, it is a strange, strange world where we redo old plays again and again and again. No, as, as surely as never before. I suppose classical music, but there's not really any other form where it would make any sense to just do the view from a bridge or whatever or Hamlet again. That's the tension point at which theatre operates. You do the same thing again, but new. You do it again, but new, again, but new. And that's a really interesting thing to do. But the new is something that's really important, I think. It's got to be said as well that and this has been said many times, but we think anecdotally from looking at the screens, frankly, that our audience was more diverse, was wider, was drawn from more places, obviously more geographical places. Um, around Ireland, people wouldn't come to Dublin Theatre Festival if they don't live in Dublin, they would, a lot of them, but, you know, they might not, you know, because the barriers to access are so much lower, you know, and and, and that's that's a huge thing, you know, it's a massive thing. I mean, I, I think that, com that coincided for us with jack gleason performing it he's quite well known um so that meant that the way the piece was communicated through the media was slightly different and maybe reached a slightly different audience to, to, to one that we don't know before also we were in the very fortunate position of being one of the only cultural events that could be attempted in at that time so that, that helps. does help yeah <laughs> never have we felt more connected with our audience than doing this show like it was so it's there's a sequence where jack feeling the video designer was really keen to just get as much use the faces as much as possible and we make these we call them the carousels these sequences where you just text is going on and you just see people's faces kind of it flicks through kind of i don't know 20 30 people's faces and it's just i still think it's just profoundly moving just to see 
everyone's bedrooms or kitchens or you know and also what they're doing when they're uploading this video so they're kind of looking for the camera and you just glimpse these people in ways that we never have when we've made a show before we've never had that kind of relationship with our audience you sort of see them when they leave see them when they arrive bitch about them because they didn't like it or they didn't laugh very much or they're kind of old or they're young or they're like school kids or you know oh, why did these people come it was this it was just a, a sort of a pain to people and audiences you go to a lot of festivals and you kind of have um a imp very impressive international body of work and i just i was just wondering if corona has made that a bit difficult now to think internationally yeah i mean not really we'll see i think about what falls out in the next couple of years you know there's a lot of talk about do we need to be taking huge big sets around the world and touring people on planes to festivals in various places. Our experience in Ireland and the UK is so different from a lot of the continental European experience. Not a lot of it, certainly in Germany and Austria, where well, I know more about what's been going on. They were back on stage, you know, they had audiences in the theatres in September, October. You know, they were kind of, they'd been rehearsing all along. But, but as a result of that, they were hit with this really, really strict lockdown, which is still in place in Vienna and couldn't and they were, oh oh we are, we're not allowed to put anything on stage at all uh shit. um <laughs> and I, I don't know much about producing houses in the uk and ireland to be honest because we don't really work in them so i don't really know much about them but like certainly that theater in vienna have this responsibility to show things to an audience all the time like it's like the idea of being dark for them is just kind of I think there's even there's something mad with the book theatre in Vienna whereby it's constitutionally written into their you know rules of existing or something that they have to play a different show on each of their stages every single night. It's to do with this kind of like so they never have anything playing for even two nights. It's an extraordinarily expensive and complicated system of people who are getting shows in and out on a daily basis. And they have this real kind of written into their constitution, this kind of cultural civic responsibility to kind of offer work to the people of Vienna you know it's kind of an old European bourgeois thing in a way but hadn't put any effort into thinking about streaming because they didn't like it and they thought totally understandably this is how it's the death of theatre theatre is about communal experiences in rooms you know and so we were asked to go and we we went and were very fortunate again to be in a rehearsal room to making a German version of that piece which premiered on New Year's Eve. It's been interesting to see different reactions to it depending on where a country is at in terms of its response to this whole crazy situation and depending on what a country thinks theatre is as well. I think weirdly enough the Viennese audience, when I say audience actually I mean critics, the Viennese critics were much more kind of sniffy about the idea of this being like this shows us what we're missing in a bad way <laughs> kind of thing right, and, and right, right. what about you Francisco what, what what do you think the, the prognosis is what's the prognosis in Budapest uh people are still rehearsing um everything is masked um I made I made a show um last summer I had two weeks to think of something this is the, the hamlet piece is it this is the hamlet yeah and it is social it is fully socially distant so uh, audiences and actors alike are are apart um apart from one scene at the fencing scene where i allowed them to touch just for the final killing um had to had to happen but the fencing actually starts social distance as well so we just folly it with some some symbols i totally feel you in the way that people were saying what what we're missing because i think a lot of not the the perform not the uh, audience but the actors found it very very difficult to not be in the same space with each other to not be allowed to actually touch or get close there was a lot of frustration when it came to very emotional scenes that they really wanted to just you know be tactile and shake each other and um that was very interesting to see from the room because my responsibility was to make something that is not just safe but also is conceptually consistent mm -hmm. i had to tell someone that actually you do have the power to show that you have grief without going to that other person and shaking them you just have to believe that by standing there and being present will resonate 
Um, but that was actually very difficult to negotiate with the actors I felt. Did you have anything um, as someone who was, who was creating this piece that, that was difficult from, from an actor's perspective, you feel? I think the whole thing was quite tricky, as I was saying before, to navigate, to negotiate what it means to be kind of present with an audience and to offer an audience that hopefully offer an audience that sense of really speaking directly to them when you can't speak directly to them because you can't. And for the, for the majority of the show, actually, those iPads aren't even switched on. And quite a, quite a few of the shots of the audience are pre-recorded about two hours before the show happens. And not all of them. And obviously there's one sequence where Jack, uh, the performer wanders into the audience and he's with them and then the live chat function comes on. One of the obsessions we had was we still kind of worry about it is that how do you prove this is live? Mm. And not just prove this live in a kind of boring way, but how does it matter that it's live? You know, why, why is it not just a short film that you're watching? You know, why? And there are small things like it's on at a certain time and you have to come at that time. And if you don't come at that time, you miss it. You know, part of what theatres around the world have done to try and kind of make this a little bit more, you know, connect this a little bit more to that event, to the theatrical event. But it, it's not enough. You know, we the chat function was one way. There's a bit in the show where the performer talks, that starts to doubt that the audience is present, but is really watching because he can't see them. You can only see their face on the screen. No matter what, it comes from there. You could have gone to the toilet. In fact, you could be asleep, you could be dead. You know, so he turns on the chat function and we speak to him. Now that, is, that does happen for real. And if you watch the show, you can chat for real. <laughs> Without wanting to destroy too many things, one of the weird things we found was that there's a, it varies, but there's an approximately 20 second time lag. And this all gets a bit Christopher Nolan's tenet for me and for all of us when we were making the show to try and figure out there's approximately a 20 second time lag between Jack's speaking, between the performer speaking and the audience member hearing what he's saying. But the chat function doesn't have any time lag. When you type something, it comes up in the chat function, everyone can see it. So the whole the, the idea was he was going to have a, a back and forth conversation with somebody. But he actually can't do that because it's impossible because so a bit of that is faked. We were really puzzled because we were like, this doesn't make any sense because people do live streams all the time. This is the thing about this technology, all technology, you know, it's so hard as theatre makers, isn't it, to try and integrate, for example, digital information technology into your work because you realise that like, we were looking at sort of doing face morphing and, and what weird things we could do. And you're like, anybody with a phone and Instagram you know, these days, or TikTok can just do so much. And, 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 the, and the technology has moved so fast and allowed people to manipulate images, for example. So you just can't, you can't dare to venture into that. So all this live streaming, well, there are live streams happening. There have been live streams happening for years where people communicate with the person talking, but it's all about quality, like the resolution quality. And so it becomes a trade-off between um, the, the image looking a1 which unfortunately we wanted it to and the, the, the audience being sort of live and we, we hopefully tried to as we go as we went we made this piece very quickly three weeks to rehearse it and about we made it from conception to premiere in about two and a half months or something from like okay let's start writing to you know so it was really and it, as it was it's quite short it's only 45 minutes and that's partly because we thought no one wants to sit on a zoom for longer than 45 minutes he, he says looking at the <laughs> The time that he's literally spent talking about a show no one's seen. This is so embarrassing. That's not true. A lot of us have seen it. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, yeah, yeah. You've seen it anyway. So, but like you say yourself with your piece, you know, you just, I don't know if you felt this, but and this is one of the great things about making theatre, isn't it? You can't spend too long worrying about the implications of the fact that they can't go and hug someone to show their grief because the fucking show's on scene, guys. So, like, <laughs> let's really really cut to this and figure out the truth and the reality of what this kind of but, but what did you so did you did you sort of create a kind of conceptual world whereby i mean i guess what i mean is can i see the show but i guess i can't now unless i wait and then uh, it is it is being revived so if you want to come around um at you when are we saying um yeah, depends yeah, on yeah. the country opening again but sure, uh, sure. i do have a recording a lot of people ask for it but it's in hungarian without any subtitles so i i don't wish that upon anyone it's so did you find that this socially distanced thing was it a, was it a case of hoping nobody noticed that or was it a case of kind of create using that aesthetic language to sort of try and think through or to try you know 
guess the yeah. latter. With, with, with Hamlet, it was a very specific choice of uh, putting the actors behind glass walls and the audience outside wearing headphones, so everyone is mic'd up. And we had an amazing um, composer who really created a soundscape that was kind of a, a, like a, a character of its own. I think it was hopefully underpinned with a conceptual, it wasn't just, um, just because it's socially distanced. But I told, I told the artistic director who asked me to do it that that was very important to me because this was May time and um, when we started talking and I said safety for me is absolutely, and I'll, obviously I loved the challenge, you know, what a great challenge, what a great puzzle to solve, like how can mm. I make it happen without putting anyone in danger? So um, mm. I think it's a nice challenge, as you said. Just two more short questions then. One is, what is the, f uh, the immediate and the long-term future for Death Center for you and Bush? Well, the immediate future is, like I say, we've been fortunate, we're making work. We, we, we are about to make a piece in Vienna, whether it'll go in front of an audience. Well, I, I believe it will go in front of an audience, um, but, whether, but it's due to currently due to go in front of an audience on April the 25th, I think, or something like that. But whether that will happen or not, I don't know. They don't know. Um, but they are doing, there's a bizarre situation, with, certainly with that theatre, and I'm sure with maybe with other theatres who have ensembles of actors, um, I don't know if that's how it works in Budapest, but what they've done in Vienna is they've basically been in rehearsals ever since, but they've kept not being able to open shows. So they've got like six shows that haven't premiered. Yeah, same And here. basically, is that, and so their plan is when they're allowed to open the theatre, they're just gonna do like, one a weekend, <laughs> it'll be like bam, 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 bam. So is that the same kind of situation that you're sort of proposing in, in Budapest? Well, yeah, it's, it's uh, especially in Budapest where there's so many freelance actors, I think a lot of them will have six, seven opening nights on the same night. I don't know how they're going to do it. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, the people of these cities are just going to get this extraordinary kind of like launch of work. So, but we're making that piece. That's a piece called Die Welt ist alles was der Fall ist. And that's my bad German. And the English is the world is all that is the case, which is a line from the first line from a book by Ludwig Wittgenstein called Tractatus Logica Philosophicus. Um, anybody who, it, you know, it, it's, 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 it seems to be uniquely uninteresting because if you have read Wittgenstein, you probably think it's hell and so you never want to see a piece based on it. And if you haven't read Wittgenstein, it's meaningless. But it's a piece which takes as a sort of imaginative starting point this kind of strange and extraordinary book that Wittgenstein, the Austrian philosopher, wrote in 1920, no earlier, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's a, but it's not a piece, it's not going to be about philosophy, it's going to be an, a piece which attempts to think about how philosophy can help us to think about the world and about tragedy and about um, meaning i guess so that piece is currently being redrafted furiously and is going to go into rehearsals next week so the rehearsal at the end of next week but to, to be a machine piece will probably um have a few more outings maybe virtual outings at various festivals depending on the things you know you just don't want to be feel awful because i'm sort of Obviously, in an ideal world, we never play that piece virtually again, <laughs> ever. <laughs> you know, of course, we're very keen on we made it to call it Spear Machine version 1.0, which was slightly a sort of silly tech joke, but also a very serious point that we will develop that piece and make a 2.0. Whether that 2.0 becomes something that is even more virtual, becomes a kind of app that whereby you have your own show and you, you can star in it or something, you know, whether we kind of move into that world or whether we end up making something that has allows audiences to congregate in a room maybe robots on stage rather than rather than in the crowd or something you know for me i don't want really to be harsh but i think i've been so responsive to even if it's theaters in faraway places to theaters who've grabbed grasped the metal and tried grasped the metal metal or whatever and tried to respond to the moment and make work and make work happen and think about what work might be and been very unimpressed by theatres who just seem to have kind of not. Now, I, and that could mean anything. I'm not saying that everyone had to rush and try and make pieces about COVID, obviously not, you know, and, and, and there is benefit to stopping and taking stock and thinking and taking time off. But at the same time, you know, theatre has to take advantage of the fact that it's a quick form, that you can get it, you can fucking make Hamlet in three weeks or whatever. It's sort of weirdly possible. And it sounds like you made a really, really brilliant innovative response and 
that's responding to the world isn't it you know and that's responding to how things feel you know god knows what this is going to feel like we, we have a piece in this development that's about intimacy and about sex and touch and how those things are experienced on stage and in real life and it's just not really going to be feasible to do this year but yeah long term god knows god knows i don't know keep struggling to try and do it and if, if it keeps just about paying the bills then you just stuck in it aren't you and then one day you'll wake up and wonder why you didn't do something different with your life i guess but i don't know i think a lot of us are very grateful that you didn't do something else with your life ah oh, listen well it's, it's it's really nice that we were able to catch the show francisco really nice that you were able to just about see yourself on so if 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 i'd known you beforehand and this is an awful secret we can put people in better seats you know <laughs> uh, we don't want to be have to because we want it to be a situation where everyone gets equal ex- but there's all sorts of ins and outs about how people get seen it's but um, i would have put you in a better seat yeah it's the equivalent of going to someone's like show and say hey i'll sort you out with a front row ticket yeah totally exactly yeah yeah for sure so i think that's actually kind of nice that people have the nicest time i think when like you, you go, I'm not fucking in it. This is bullshit, isn't it? Oh, no, there I am. It's not bullshit. <laughs> and the other really nice thing that happened, certainly in Dublin, is people spotted each other. And so you mm-hmm. saw people on social media afterwards saying kind of like, hey, so-and-so, I saw you at the theatre tonight. You were at Dead Centre Show. You know what I mean? Yeah, it happened it to me. The... I did that. <laughs> cool, cool. And that's so, that was just all these weird things that were kind of completely, we never thought about or considered, you know, that people were really kind of sort of missing but thank you so much for asking and, and for thanks for watching the show and for engaging in the show it was really it was really it was a much lonelier experience than making a lot of shows are because the show would finish every night we were making it in such extreme conditions we had to go within two meters of each other we all had to put the full mask at all times we weren't allowed to have a drink in the theater afterwards we had to walk out into the streets there was no pubs open we had to just walk home every night and it was so horrible there was no audience you realize how so to have people like yourself kind of reaching out and saying they're connected with it is really heartening and really nice and really really joyful so thank you no, and thank I, you. I am tempted to ask i would like you to send me the hamlet recording if you don't mind i will it's in hungarian and we put uh, poems in it and our own text so it's completely bastardized but i, will I definitely... definitely i definitely know what happens in hamlet though really really well <laughs> so i can definitely you know and I'm, i'd be also fascinated to know this is another interesting thing about this world of dreaming what was amazing is how many theaters really wanted to put their archives online but couldn't because they'd never filmed pieces in any degree of quality you know mm. and we've always from day one filmed our work bush inherited this from other company he'd work with who work on the traveling festival circuit film your work as well as you possibly can it's more important like cancel a performance to film the show because it's the most important thing well look i'd love to see it so i'll, you know. I'll send it to you um nice i only one. have i only have one more question for you ben this is what i ask from every guest at the end of our talk you mentioned that i'm in an auditorium and it's empty and um the question is if you were here and if anything were possible what would you like to make oh god it's the worst that's the worst because it's once you as you said before about your hand once you take all the shackles off then all of a sudden you've got nothing you're like oh nothing we have a friend who does what what's your dream what is it what do you want to see on stage what is your dream and unfortunately that just cripples me but I think, look, I was really nice. It's nice to see. I haven't seen an auditorium for a good long while, a proper one. We've made to be a machine in studios, which is nice, but to see a proper auditorium, it made me think, because it looked a bit, I'm sure this isn't true, it looked a bit like your laptop was actually on the lip of the stage, but obviously that isn't quite true, because I wouldn't. I have, I, have a, I have a director's desk, unfortunately. But, right, But the lip yeah, is not yeah, too yeah. far. It's a couple of rows down. Well, it made me want to see, because like, you know that thing about, like, the unfortunate truth we found it to be a machine but it's definitely true everywhere i think it's really true if you've ever been to shakespeare's globe in london the best place to stand in shakespeare's globe is on that stage if you ever stood on that stage it's fucking cool tremendously boring to stand anywhere else or sit anywhere else in that theater but to stand on the stage is incredible and it's so often the place it's the coolest place to stand and the best view you can possibly get in the future is the one that no audience members ever get so i would say we this is a cheat i just occurred to me and you were saying that we we wanted to do this in a show previously we didn't do it because we couldn't afford it couldn't figure out how to do it but we wanted to do a thing where we got the audience the whole audience onto the stage at some point close the curtains behind them do a bit of something on stage and never quite care what about 10 minutes of material to keep the audience kind of so weird isn't it to think about imagine 300 people on a in a close play position like this next to each other 
and then you'd open the curtains again and you have a new audience in there applauding. And, they could sort of get, and we did get a little bit down the road of figuring out how we tested that with like 30 people in a, in a studio and it sort of worked, you know, but it was never feasible. But it's still something I'd love to do. And I'd like, like looking at the auditorium, you'd want to put, give an audience a chance to be on the stage and look out and see what it's like to have, I don't know how many people can sit in that theatre, but to have hundreds of people applauding them or, bow, or, or, or you know, giving them a standing ovation, you know, just like, you know, we should do that for the audience, especially for us, it's be a machine. Thanks for sticking with the audiences. Thanks for coming along and paying 15 quid to look at something on your computer when you could have watched Netflix, you know, like, nice one. <laughs> you know, thank you for sticking with us. So that would be my hope. Thank you so much, Ben, again. And, um, and, well, stay safe and stay well. I guess we have to say that now. And you, yeah, and you look after yourself. This was Traverse. Thank you so much for joining us. And join us next time to see what's next for our industry.